Well, the F40 story actually started with a, another model, with a 288 GTO. Um, it was launched in 1984 as a limited edition special prototype. And um, shortly after that, Ferrari got the idea of competing in the FIA Group B rally and going up against the Porsche 959, so built uh, five GTO Evolution cars. And as we all know, Group B racing, uh, spectators were getting killed and, and it was getting out of hand, so unfortunately Group B racing and rallying was, it was knocked on the head. Leaving Ferrari with, with five prototypes with nothing to do. The F40 was thought about and developed by using the five 288 GTO Evolution cars, so that they had a job. And reading be between the lines, I think Enzo Ferrari realised that it, this was probably getting to the end of his life and he wanted to leave a legacy um, with a very special car. That was the first 200 mile an hour motor car, and that was a big deal. It's very significant to Ferrari being the last car that Enzo Ferrari was involved with. Um, it's built in a, in a very, very special way, even though Ferrari don't admit it had a job for racing. Trust me, that is a race car. There are no interior lights. There are wind-up windows. There is a, a, a cable to pull to get out of it. There is what looks like bathroom sealant on the floor, which bonds it together. The gaps in the doors are crazy, but it is a crazy car. It looked like it had been built around the back of Ferrari, not on a production line. The, the, the quality of bits and pieces were ridiculous, but it, it just takes your breath away. And all these years later, it still does. I've said this many times, um, uh, when asked what is it like to, to be driven in or drive an F40. And my answer is that you definitely should be able to get one on the national health. And this country would never have depression, I promise you. My first experience was a, a passenger coming back out of Maranello in Italy. And when the turbos come on, and I'm, a, and I'm an ardent, experienced driver, um, it does take your breath away. It does physically take your breath away. The sheer velocity of the car under acceleration, you, you feel that this is a thousand and four hundred horsepower, not four hundred and some horsepower. It's, it's, it's quite uncanny. I remember coming back from, from Italy and I was again passenger in the middle of the night and the, the, the client who was a racing driver thought it was funny to come up on the, on the French motorways behind the truck that's doing 40 miles an hour quite quickly and look as though he's going to drive through the truck and at the last moment use it as a chicane. And this is what racing drivers do. So when it was my turn, I was um, approaching a, a 40 mile an hour truck at a little bit over 70. And um, I pretended to fall asleep in the middle of the night. I, I started nodding like this and, uh, and because he's a brave racing driver, he didn't want to bottle out. Um, and, but I made him in the end, so John, and of course I used it as a cane and got him back. It's a phenomenal experience. I got involved um, with the Ferrari F40 right at the beginning. I flew to Italy to collect a new motor car that was going to become the first racing car, first racing F40 in this country. And I spent time at the Michelotto factory learning how to tweak these things before driving the car back to Yorkshire. I was coming up the, uh, towards Mont Blanc Tunnel and past Coimier. I was with the client and it was my turn to drive. And we were traffic hopping because quite clearly this car was ballistic on the turbochargers. So long line of traffic and a gap, eight cars in front. Basically, you hit the gas pedal and you arrived in that gap. And, and uh, I happened to arrive in a gap with a police jeep. Um, in, right behind me and they seemed very ecstatic about what I'd done and I, I, the way they were waving at me I think actually they approved. In 1994 um, whilst preparing a 308 lightweight for a client in Belgium at the Spa-Francorchamps circuit um, I, I witnessed a race involving oh, half a dozen maybe eight F40 LMs and GTEs. I've never seen such a race um, going into La Source airpin 
three abreast into the corner, spitting flames, the noise, it, it was just something that it, it, it stuck in my mind and will do for my dying day. Um, I never thought in my wildest dreams that in 1996 I would be in that race in an F40. And I was. And it's one of these two that's behind me. Um, on the Saturday morning, um, I qualified in a standard F40 on wet ra racing tyres in torrential downpour. Um, it was that bad that the only way I knew where my braking points were was to look left at the scenery. And I qualified that car third on the grid among these amazing F40s. Afterwards, back in, in our camp in the paddock, I, I, I was in the back of the truck taking my overalls off and I started to shake. And then I started to cry. And it was the adrenaline that was running out of me that was so extreme. We still hold a record round Zanfort in that car, um, mainly because they changed the circuit, but it still stands. In 1999, a, a guy called Richard Percy offered me his F40 to win some championships. That's the other car that's behind me. And in fact, I, I won the 99 championship. It's really spooky that out of 1,200-ish cars, these two cars that were lent to me as consecutive chassis numbers, which is really odd. It's a really spooky thing. I don't know what that means, but it is true. It's the first time these two cars have been together. What is extraordinary is that I can sit in those two cars blindfolded and I would tell you, even without even starting them, which one's which. These are cars that you do strap on. You do, they do become another part of your body. And I get quite emotional about the old Spitfire boys and um, they get reunited with a Spitfire and um, they, they sit in the, the aeroplane and 80 year old, 90 year old and the, the Spitfire's familiar to them. And if I ever live to that sort of age, I'd like to think that that would happen to me, that these cars would feel natural to me. And, um, and of course, I'd expect to be given a couple of laps in the driving seat. Richard, who, who uh, races a Porsche himself in, in club racing, uh, and I are going to drive the cars. So we're going to get togged up. Um, I have to mention that I'll be wearing <clears throat> my 2001 race suit, which in actual fact still fits me. To be running one of the cars uh, that you know I had all those stories and all those battles in, um, I'm sure the memories are going to flood back. <laughs> to say there are no computers in an F40 actually is incorrect, right? Because there are sensors in the driver's fingers, there are sensors in your bottom, and there are sensors in your feet, and they're connected to the master computer. And you strap this thing on, this becomes an extension 
of your body. And those days were going to go as soon as the electronic cars came. And that's what happened. Our natural progression was to be an electronic car. A 360 Challenge, a 430 Challenge. Um, and it didn't happen. And I'm not really sad that it didn't happen. It's the electronic age and I'm probably a dinosaur. I didn't really have a racing career. This, this was just someone lending me cars and going and winning championships. And we, we did it in a very serious manner. We didn't understand second. Ayrton Senna was my mentor, but I didn't know that. And I learned everything from that man. It, there was no second, it had to win. And I remember one special time at Donington with the 96 car. And um, it was the first race of the season. I got pole position. Um, off the line, I lost all the gearbox selection and 32 cars passed me. And I managed to get a gear and chase the cars. And I caught the cars and it was quite a dramatic race and uh, I kept losing gears and in the end I decided to leave it in fourth gear and try to win the race. My team thought that I'd broken down and started packing up on the pit wall and I won the race. Just, I didn't know that my father, my mother, and my children were in the crowd to my right. And I said to the boys, that if we take first blood at this, at this championship, I'm gonna stand on the bonnet and I'm gonna give it. So with my helmet on and straight out of the car, stand on the bonnet and I, I guess, okay. And just there is my dad, and my mum, and they're just crying, you know. Um, and that was very special. But Dad would be very proud. My mum would be very proud. I just wish that they were here today to see this, maybe. To me, the, the F40 is the last of a breed. And that's important to me. That breed is important to me. After the F40, we got cars that weren't as dramatic. But this was only a sign of the times. You could never produce another F40 for many, many reasons. So we're lucky to have experienced an F40 in 1987. We're lucky to have had that because shortly after that, the world changed and attitudes changed. And today Ferrari makes some fantastic machinery and, and they're every bit as good as everybody else's top supercar. But they don't make your heart race. They don't make you tremble when you get out of an F12, for example, like it does getting out of an F40. And that'll never be repeated. When we look back on this, um, I, I tear in, in the eye, to be fair, because it's almost like we were all plugged in to the adrenaline and the time came to unplug it. And it's very difficult to live with. Those times were special times. Ferrari is my life. I started with it in 1975. I've done nothing other than Ferrari till today. I'm still doing it. It's a name that's often misunderstood is Ferrari. Um, Ferrari could be a bit of a show off and a bit of a flash sort of thing, but um, it is a mistake. If you read the history books and you understand who and what Enzo Ferrari was, um, how he, he shaped uh, the, the Formula One uh, of the time and um, the mystique behind the man and the product is, is, I can't think of any other manufacturer that shares that. I'm quite proud to say that I am part of Ferrari. If, when my time has run, when my race is run and I go to the racetrack in the sky, I would love to think that I've made just a tiny little bit of difference.